Hello, Susan. Hi, can't see me. Yeah, it's a little, yeah, the sun's a little bright. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah. Right. How are you doing today? Um, not bad, I guess. I woke up to see the dog had tried to eat the guts of the deer that they brought home the other day, which oh. was not good. But, um, <laughs> they've been hunting. Oh, yeah. The last day of hunting was yesterday. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, it doesn't sound great, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my dog is a uh, definitely a dog. <laughs> Put <it> that way. <laughs> you want to see him? <laughs> sure. I'm not doing anything else. Or no, I'll see if I can get this. Oh, I have a mess, but. Can you see him? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. There he is. Yep. Oh, Schmucko. <laughs> well, that's okay. You can stay back. He's not he's not allowed on the couch, and so he's not allowed anywhere near it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have problems. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, I found a paper online, but that I thought you might be interested in. So I can either read the title to you or send it to you. Um, I don't know if I can find it at the moment, but I can try. What is the title? Or what's the idea? Um, yeah, just remembering. Uh, I am trying to finish um, a bunch of mechanics, um, online mechanics. And uh, so... Things are not as together as they normally are. Yeah. So, evolution, primary body axis, maybe? Oh. I think maybe. I have that paper in the folder. Okay. No, oh, then that's yours. No, I... Oh. Okay, then that's yours? That might be... Yeah, no, hidden. <sighs> I don't know. It, it was, um, I should have taken better note of these things. Oh. What was it about, like? Well, it was on the development of C. elegans. So it had C. elegans in the title. Oh. Temporal scaling in oh, C. Yeah. elegans larva development? Yeah, we have that. Actually, uh, Krishna sent me that, that one. Or he put it in the Slack oh. channel. And, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, we'll probably review that this week. We'll look at it. All over. right. Okay, then you have it, and I don't need to worry about that. And then I've got smaller salamander species associated with smaller genomes. So, huh. that was her. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds interesting. Okay. All right, well then, I should I'll just make a note. And send it to you. Or do you want me to try to send it right now? Uh, well, probably not. Probably after. Well, you can send it now, but I won't be able to see it till after the meeting. So. Yeah, that's That'd fine. Right. Yeah. <laughs> then I'll pass it on to people in the group. Okay. Yeah, it sounds good. All right. I just. I'll send that along then. I knew there was. If you got the one on the C. elegans, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know who's going to, uh, yeah, I don't know who's coming to the meeting. I don't know if I should start because I'll record it uh, for people who aren't able to make the meeting uh, and we'll just follow along. So um, I don't, yeah, if, if someone comes in during our, 
agenda, then, you know, they can catch up. So welcome to the meeting. Uh, welcome, mm -hmm. Susan. Uh, and today we're going to talk a couple about a couple things. Uh, prepared an uh, update on a talk that we we uh, had a session on uh, like machine learning in, in fall of 2019 called DivaWorm ML. And uh, if you've been in the group a while, you, you probably attended it or you heard about it. Uh, and so it was a series of lectures on different topics. And so today I'm going to talk about a topic that we touched on last week uh, called pareidolia. And this is going to be computational pareidolia. But I've updated it uh, with a, a number of slides, you know, uh, based on like some of the things I, I kind of created the lecture in an ad hoc manner in 2019, but I've since, uh, you know, run across articles and, and things have happened since then that uh, deserve, it deserves an update. So we're going to do that. Uh, we'll also have some papers that uh, I'd like to review um, and uh, the, the temporal scaling paper is one and there are a couple other papers that we should probably uh, talk about and they're pretty interesting papers. Um, and then we'll probably go over, and this is for people watching on YouTube for the task board and what's uh, just kind of an update on what's there, just to remind everyone. Oh, Shruti's here. Okay. Hello, Shruti. Hello, hello, everyone. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? All right. So we're just starting the meeting. Uh, we're going to do a presentation, or I'm going to give a presentation update, and then I'm going to go over some papers and, and talk about the different things going on in the group, just kind of a reminder of where we are. So, yeah. All right. So, again, okay. if you have, yeah. Uh, I, could sh I could shut off my, um, my visual feed if that would help. That probably will. Probably. I mean, it's fine. It doesn't really matter. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well. Uh, hi, Krishna. How are you? Hi, how are you? Hello. <laughs> Hello. All right. Hi. So, hi. Oh, Susan. <laughs> hi. Um, so, we have, yeah, we have a... So, why don't we get started here? Um, I'll probably start with this presentation. So, uh, for Krishna and Shruti, you didn't hear. This was a a presentation that uh, you can't hear. Hmm. Okay, so he's going to come back. All right, why don't I go to the actually go to the uh, meeting board or the task board first, just because that's a little bit more. A little bit less, I'd like Krishna to see the whole presentation on this. So, uh, right, so our task board is here. We have, this is our repository. This is the, uh, uh, where is this? I don't think I have, oh, here it is. This is the DivaWorm ML repository. So this was the course that we had last fall, and these are the materials. Um, so there were a bunch of lectures here that, uh, were are sort of frozen in 2019, but I'm trying to update them. Uh, so we had a, a number of different uh, presentations that are sort of uh, machine learning from a Devo worm perspective, and that means that it's either projects that Devo worm is engaged in, or uh, you know, machine learning that's relevant to biological systems, developmental systems, and so forth. And so we had a lot of stuff. The pre-trained models lecture actually turned into a Google Summer of Code project. Uh, so then we'll have to update that with the actual project um, areas. Hi, right, Krishna. So, yeah, so this is this was the course that we did. It was last fall, and it needs to be updated a bit. Uh, but I think it was a pretty nice uh, course. And if you get the chance, you should check it out, just even in its current state. But we'll be updating this course um, just gradually. So that's the course. 
And then as for the um, task board, let's just go over that real quick. Here are the major tasks for 2020. So this is the task board and group meetings. And we have a lot of things here. Uh, so we have a number of things that are either in progress or on hold or to do, or maybe is an action item, which is more like something we want to accomplish short term. Uh, so in progress, uh, we have a, something called Krishna paper review. I think that was a paper that Krishna wanted to review. I'm not sure if that happened. Oh, that might have been the paper you're writing on Sarsa. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that that's uh, sort of in progress. Um, you know, and we can keep it in progress for as long as we want. Um, the Devorn bibliography and EndNote, that's also in progress. So Dick and I have been working on a bibliography with different resources in it. Um, and that's in progress. Uh, Lagrangian embryo readings. So that was something that we talked about several weeks ago. Uh, we're still working on the readings for that. That kind of got pushed back. We can put that in hold for now. Oops. I can't move it because I'm not in the right account, I guess. Well, anyways, that's okay. Um, uh, bibliography and EndNote is kind of, 59 is tied to 48. Um, create a theory layer for DevoLearn. That's something that uh, actually is labeled Hacktoberfest, but I've been working on a little bit um, recently, and that's going to be something that'll be, we'll be making progress on uh, shortly. So this, again, is the DevoLearn platform that has the DevoLearn software, uh, some other software, the, you know, our collection of deep learning and machine learning software, some data science tutorials, and then this theory layer, which is like a, you know, to teach people about theory building and maybe, you know, about how to put theory on top of the analysis that they're doing in the DevoLearn platform. Uh, this periodicity paper is something that will be coming up in the next month because we need a draft due by the end of the year. So I'm going to be working on that. Um, and in the next week or two, I'll start really kind of focusing on that. And maybe in a couple weeks, we'll talk about, you know, details about what's needed to get that draft out. I know we talked about people being interested in it. Uh, Ojwal and I think Susan and maybe Jesse and maybe Dick. Uh, there are a bunch of people who want to do things on that. Um, so we haven't really uh, fleshed it out. I'm going to be fleshing it out um, in the next couple weeks. And then I'll let you know maybe more specific things you can help with or contribute or whatever. Uh, this paper, work on biosystem special issue paper, this 41 is linked to 47. Uh, complexity measures is something we haven't talked about recently, but it's uh, where we've talked about different uh, topics and complexity and we're kind of assembling a set of measures or a set of techniques. So that's, that's ongoing. Um, we haven't had any developments on it though recently. Uh, finally, this Basilaria non neuronal cognition paper. So this is um, a paper we're working on, and I think we're planning on submitting it early next year. So we have a bit of time on that. Uh, there's an issue 65 here, which is follow-up in Basilaria psychophysics. And that is actually linked to this because this is a presentation that uh, we prepared for Neuromatch, and that kind of laid the groundwork for some of the technical detail for this paper. So this paper will be uh, probably the paper, like the paper would be, it'd be finishing up the paper, getting fleshed out maybe in January or February. So stay tuned for that. Uh, so that's all the in-progress stuff. Now action items, uh, we want to follow up on the Devorn bibliography follow up on the periodicity paper, Basilaria psychophysics. Uh, those are all papers and bibliographies. Uh, then I don't know if you got the email last week, but 
uh, Dick Gordon sent out a, a bibliography for the giggle pic, gigapixel technique. And so that was something that was uh, sort of related to Susan's presentation on um, imaging. And he had proposed that you could use gigapixel techniques and he sent a bibliography on that and maybe a, a short article. I, I sent it out to the group via email. So um, that's that that's something we might follow up on as well. It was interesting. It was a it's a technique where you basically sample an image at a very high resolution and then downsample it. And there there uh, it, I didn't really read a lot about it, but it looks interesting. Um, and then finally, we have the axolotl embryo animations and segmentation. So we're still kind of in a holding pattern on that, but I wanted to make that into an action item. Um, maybe that'll be uh, happening soon. So update hold, we have updates on axolotl data and analysis. I know Ujwal had some uh, things on that to, to say, but he's been out of the loop for the last several weeks due to some uh, issues at, you know. With, I have, yeah. I, I have uh, a new technique to get 3D or 4D imaging coming right up. It's being 3D printed. And I have some small microscopes. So I'm going to put them in a, a sphere. Okay. And hopefully get images from all sides of the embryo and then um, they'll be stationary so you'll know exactly what angle they're coming from and that might make the imaging easier the stitching yeah yeah because right now I think that we're well the next step that we have and it's a little hard is to project like to take all the uh, acquisitions and put them onto like a spherical projection or a, something similar that we can represent it um, as, a, as a map. So the idea is to have it as a map that you can explore. Um, it could be, you know, on a sphere or it could be a flat map that you can move around on and, and explore it. And so that would be, you know, I guess the, you know, it can be put into a projection, but that's a little tough because you end up like deforming the image, some images somewhat and getting it to fit together. But um, you know, if we could have the, the better sampling we can have in that 3D space, the better, because you can then sample the different sides of it and you don't have to deform it as much. And so, yeah. yeah, so I'm just going to have, I think it was nine small microscopes taking images from all sides of the, the spherical egg. That was the idea, anyway. I'm going to try it with the canola seed first. Okay. With dots of uh, felt marker on it or something so I can... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll try it out, see if it'll work. All right. Sounds good. So, yeah. And then, uh, so that was for the axolotl project. Uh, then we have the recruiting people as Devo Learning contributors. So that was Hacktoberfest. And, and as I updated uh, you a couple weeks ago, we had uh, good interest in it. I think, you know, at least at the beginning, it kind of fell off towards the end. But we had, you know, a fair number of people contribute. And so I don't know, really, I mean, for some large orgs, you know, they get hundreds of people, but uh, I think we did pretty well. And so, you know, we're gonna just keep recruiting people uh, perhaps, you know, uh, we'll be doing some public presentations about Devo Learn and other things in the near future. So that'll help to get the public awareness up on in terms of what Devo Learn is all about. So uh, I have these Hacktoberfest labels still on here because it's just kind of a reminder of the things we're doing for Hacktoberfest, but also sort of promotional things that we might do in the future. So we have these tutorials for YouTube and this embryo model, model for the uh, open worm blender container. And th those both can be maybe like potential, uh, you know, issues that someone might take on as a new member of Devo or, or Devo worm. Uh, they might want to take that on, take ownership of that and, and create something. So that's, that's a possibility. Uh, neural organoids, uh, we haven't talked about that. 
really at all in here, but that's something that I've been talking about with other people. Uh, I haven't really given too much thought to that, so we'll leave that in hold for now. Um, their embryo visualization for the open worm docker that's related to this 38. Um, again, we need something as a visualization or a simulation that's very simple that we can put into the open worm docker container, which contains sort of an executable of all the different programs that run under open worm. Um, you know, like represent open worm. So from like a biophysical simulation to uh, a neural network simulation to uh, other types of simulations that show the worm and it's all the adult worms. So they don't really have a developmental component. So it would be nice for, to have that. Um, the rest of these are not really action items. They're just kind of things that have fallen through the cracks. I have a couple things I'd like to review, but probably wait till next year on that. This uh, CT computed tomography via cloud computing, that was a an idea that happened long ago, but it never really materialized. And then the axolotl montaging is this related to the axolotl work. And so that's montaging just means it's going to be, you'll take the images and project them somehow onto either a sphere or a flat surface so you have like something to explore for people. Um, that's a whole process in and of itself. So, I mean, that's that's something that we can, it'll be sort of a, it, it won't be a trivial thing. So, um, and then finally to do, uh, we have a recap presentation from 2020. So every year now, I think we're gonna do this where we at sort of in, in early January, we're gonna do a presentation on the previous year's goings on and where we, you know, assess where we are and where we're going. So I did this last year, um, and I think that's a good thing to do every year. So that'll be coming up. Um, I think that'll be useful for sort of aligning maybe our group meetings board here with the reality of what we're going to do going forward. And, you know, it'll it'll help reorient us or orient us to, to the same things. So I think it's good. Uh, that'll be a good exercise. Um, so this uh, annotated bibliography on computational developmental biology topics. So this is something that I think I mentioned before in the um, a couple weeks ago with respect to annotated bibliographies. So you know if we think of a topic we want to cover we want coverage on some topic that maybe perhaps like some imaging topic or some machine learning topic, we can create these annotated bibliographies where we just get like a, a, some some references and, you know, write a couple of sentences about why the paper is important and then have it published in our, one of our uh, locations. And, it'll, you know, it might be useful for education. It might be useful for people coming into the group um, so that's that's an open issue. That's a recent issue, I think. But I think it's it's also relates to these bibliographies that we're creating in EndNote. And uh, so these bibliographies in EndNote are just references that are formatted so that people can download them in one place. This is a little bit different. This is where you have a collection of references with uh, sort of an annotation. And it helps people understand the literature better. Um, so this paper review, scale-free biology, this is something Jesse Parent wanted to do, um, but hasn't really moved. So, you know, that's that probably should be in hold. Uh, and then these last two are sort of older issues that never got off the ground. So, as you can see, we have a lot of issues that maybe need to be reevaluated, merged, split apart. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I try maintaining it, but uh, if you have any issue, if you have any, let me give a link to this. So if you have any suggestions on how we might uh, sort through this, if there's things that you think that we should, uh, someone wants to take on or someone wants to, uh, you know, 
then, you know, if, if you can think of ways we can split them up, then you're welcome to suggest those. And to review, you know, every issue has a number here. So if you want to talk about an issue, usually you'd cite the number and then we can go to go to that uh, issue and address it as an individual thing. And some of these issues are linked. So like anything that's his bibliography are linked. So like 40, 4859 uh, and the annotated 61, those are all linked. And so those, I don't, they don't have a good way to link issues and get up issue boards. So it's just kind of something that you see from the co-occurrence of a, a term in the in the uh, issue. So those are all things that, you know, we can review um, as needed. So so anyways, I just wanted to present on that and, and uh, review things to see where we stand. So the next thing I wanted to talk about um, was this uh, presentation on computational pareidolia. So I think uh, Krishna dropped right when I was talking about it. So the idea behind this is, this is one of the presentations that we did in Diva Worm ML in 2019. And uh, I'm updating it for 2020. Uh, I'm gonna keep updating these uh, presentations as needed. Um, and, you know, I just wanna keep the content fresh. So this is uh, computational pareidolia. We talked about this with respect to um, Mayuk's work. So this is computational pareidolia. And I'll explain what pareidolia is in a minute, but this is a, a I think it's a generative model created by a style GAN, which is a style transfer algorithm. It's a generative adversarial network and they're using a style transfer algorithm to create this artwork. And so this is uh, one of the pieces of artwork generated by it. And you'll see what, why the, there's a kind of a face in there and you'll see why that's relevant in a minute. So this is my uh, project that he posted on LinkedIn last week. He presented on it last week in the group. So he's doing this thing, Torch Dreams, which is a platform for kind of creating a similar type of uh, generative art. So he's generating these uh, images that are based on what the network is doing while it's dreaming. Um, you can use it to see what neural networks see. And so this is kind of an idea here of generating these patterns that are that look like they really have a lot of structure. Um, and they're kind of generated from random processes, but they have, they look like something. It's like looking at clouds. You can see things in the clouds that, you know, don't necessarily exist purposefully in the clouds, but are nevertheless something you extract. So I guess the question is, why is that so attractive to us as humans? looking at these things why why do we see things like animal shapes and clouds or why do we see you know patterns in these in these images that aren't really you know they're they're not really put there as patterns they're sort of generated at random so why do we see that and so that's related to a phenomenon called pareidolia and so this is uh where you see faces in things objects in nature or you know in in the human environment so you have a couple of this is obviously like they put a set of cookie monster eyes and a cookie on the lid of this trash can but this was put there because the trash can kind of looked like the cookie monster from sesame street so that you know but the that the mouth this opening reminded them of that mouth if you look at a light or a power outlet Hi. you can see like a face. What was it? You're going to say something, Susan? Oh, I have a friend who whose whole um, artwork is like that. Maybe I can, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It's the... To show people, but it's, I don't know if you can see that. This is a picture of a rock close up. And oh. she saw a horse there. Okay. It actually has a, a meaning. This is the guiding horses looking for the missing and murdered Aboriginal women. Yeah. Made it into quite the 
piece of artwork and it sells like this is my copy of it. She also but has a face. <laughs> it's her. Oh, it's no. her. Pardon? Yeah, it also has a human like face above the horse. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And she's she that's the way she does her artwork. I mean, it's just a sample of it. A good sample, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's that's exactly kind of the thing I'm talking about here. And like, uh, you know, so it's it's just basically, you know, people see things you can see in this cup of coffee in the in the air bubbles here. You have sort of what looks like a face. So, Wikipedia defines pareidolia as interpreting a vague stimulus as something known to the observer. So these are, you know, not necessarily faces, but they look like faces to us. When we see them, we recognize faces pretty well. Um, and then we recognize these things. They have like kind of looks like eyes and mouth and a mouth. And th so we, we assign this face uh, category to it where we interpret these things as parts of a face. And so this is something that, you know, everyone does. And it's not something that means, you know, that you're, we'll talk about the category or aspect of it later, but it's uh, basically the Greek, uh, the way that uh, pareidolia, what it means in Greek is that it's beside or beyond, which is the para part, and then the eidolon part is the form or image. So it's uh, beside the image or beside the form. So uh, it, this brings up a lot of, you know, because we think about this, this is these things like this doorway where you have these two openings here and then this slot here, it looks like a face. The thing has like a structure, but then we assign meaning to the on top of it. So this actually is pretty interesting from a semantic standpoint. Um, and so this is another example. This is actually of a bistable uh, perception. And you may have seen these in psychology textbooks or in psychology experiments where if you take this image here on the left, uh, you know, it looks like a duck or it can look like a rabbit, depending on how you look at it. So if you're looking at it, you'll see a duck or a rabbit. And then if you shake your head and you train, retrain your eyes, you'll get like a, you'll be able to see the rabbit. So the rabbit's ears are here and the duck's bill is here. So it's like you can see that, you know, if you look at it, it, yeah, it's, it's by what they call bistable. And so this is something they call the duck rabbit illusion. And so what they did with this though, is they took this image and they uh, used Google Cloud Vision to analyze it. So now this is like, we're taking this thing and we're taking a machine learning algorithm that isn't, uh, you know, it doesn't have this sort of semantic layer. Uh, it's just basically analyzing it as a natural feature. So we may or may not expect this uh, bistable perception to exist. But it actually finds that it, pred it it predicts it in both directions. So it'll predict it both as a duck and a rabbit. So there's a, you know, in, in different probabilities. So the idea is once they start rotating this image, and remember, they're not changing the image, they're just rotating in space. It starts predicting it as either a duck or a rabbit. So I guess if it's like at this angle, if you shift it maybe to the left of, of you know, from the top, if you shift it to the left 45 degrees, it would be more likely to be predicted as a duck. Whereas if you shift it in the other direction, 45 degrees, it would be more likely to be seen as a rabbit. So that's interesting because there's really no difference in the actual content of the image, just in how the algorithm sees it. And we know in humans, this is something that we do as a way to assign some meaning onto it or as a interpretation of what we're seeing but the machine learning algorithm doesn't have that aspect to it so um so this is uh you know so this this phenomenon pareidolia also works with ambiguous images so what actually is going on here um i've actually written a couple of blog posts about this or i have a i wrote a blog post about this and there are some other blog posts if you're interested in this topic a little bit more. And these, these blog posts provide like some, I think some basic um, 
information about it, but specifically in terms of like how computers might deal with this problem. So there's this uh, post here on directly on pareidolia. There's another one, robot looks for faces in clouds. And I'll give you these slides after, I'll make these slides available after the meeting so you can get these links. A bug of the human mind reproduced in computers and then an idea for a personality engine which is where uh, machine pareidolia meets face tracker. So let me see, there was a comment in the chat here, I believe. So Krishna also shared a um, article here, a medium article, a new brain inspired intelligence system drives a car using only 19 control neurons. Yeah, actually, it's uh, hello. It's yeah. somewhat, you know, inspired by C. Elegant, and I guess it's a really, very interesting topic okay. that uh, we should be, you know, looking into. Oh yeah. But it's uh, yeah, it's a mixture of biological uh, computational methods, and as well as you know, the core of open mom is into C. Elegant. So I guess it's a pretty much interesting topic. Yeah. Well. Yeah. We actually we're going to talk about a paper later. Uh, yeah. th that one that you sent before. So we'll we'll talk about yeah. that when we talk about the other one. Yeah. So yeah, that was, that's thank you. Um, so check these blog posts out, and I'll, I'll send the links later. Um, but th so another way we can approach uh, pareidolia through like computers and computer algorithms is using a genetic algorithm. And there's a genetic algorithm called Pareto loop, and this is uh, this is the link here for Pareto loop, and it's featured in this article called How to Breed a Face. So this is a really interesting thing that they did here. So we talked about you know how things can look like faces, where things can have like two different uh, you know sort of ways of you know is it a duck or is it a uh, a rabbit. In this case, what they're doing is they're, ta they're basically taking a bunch of geometric shapes and they're breeding what they call face. And so in genetic algorithms, what you do is you take a bunch of, uh, you know, in this case, you have like a bunch of uh, uh, genes that encode different features of an image. In this case, they're geometric structures like, you know, shapes like triangles and things like that. And then you recombine them and you, you know, so that they're overlaying each other in the image and they produce all this, these different variant images. So you get it like about, you know, 100,000 images that have different variations of these shapes that are overlapping. And then you select on those based on what maybe looks most, in this case, what looks most like a face. So you're actually selecting on things that aren't really a face. They're just shapes that are overlaying on each other and you're selecting in what looks most like a face. You give the computer criterion. Sometimes people do this with people who evaluate the thing and you, they say, well, that looks like a face. That doesn't look like a face. But you can also automate this and say, I'm going to select things that look most like a face given these criterion. And so you can do this um, in over a number of generations. You end up with something that looks like the Mona Lisa. So on the right, you have an image that then looks something like the Mona Lisa. Um, and, you know, it looks like a face. They're targeting this face. And so they can actually get it from selecting on a bunch of random polygons over time as these, you know, these programs sort of get selected. And then new, new variants arise from the ones that look more like a face. And through this process, you end up with this thing that, sort of approximates the Mona Lisa, although it doesn't really look like the Mona Lisa entirely. I mean, that's what we're seeing. It looks enough like the Mona Lisa to say that's what it is. But it actually, if you zoom in, it's just a bunch of polygons. And some of the detail, of course, is missing, like around the mouth and around the eyes, but we can still recognize it as a face. So that's an interesting way to approach it. Um, another way to approach this problem, and this is more general. This is uh, a study on um, visual illusions. So this zooms out a little bit and asks the question, if we have these visual illusions, you know, can we uh, maybe uh, predict 
visual illusions using uh, deep learning architecture? Can we, you know, how, how do we know, how can we sort of divide out like what's going on in terms of visual illusions versus not? Because like I said, computers don't have that semantic layer. So maybe it's a matter of uh, processing. And so that's what these people, these authors did here, Wantanabe et al. A looser emotion produced by deep neural networks trained for prediction. And so what they did was they used this architecture called PredNet, which is a deep learning neural network based on predictive coding. And so if you don't know what predictive coding is, I'm not going to explain it here, but it's a, a method that we, uh, it's a theory, I guess, that people use to explain how the brain is able to sort of predict uh, stimuli, incoming stimuli, in a way that is, um, that allows them to put things together and form a uh, coherent percept. So, uh, you know, you're able to do, you know, the, the neurons in, in the brain are able to predict subsequent uh, stimuli coming in and put together like a coherent percept, put together, um, you know, a response and, and so forth. And so um, if you want to know more about predictive coding, we can talk more about it, but just suffice it to say that that's the way it worked. And so uh, using this architecture, they were ac able to accurately predict motion and direction of the, so this image here on the left, it's a series of propellers. Now this image isn't moving, it's just a visual illusion. It looks like it's moving. If you look at it, you stare at it for a while, you'll see it looks like it's moving slowly. The gear, these gears here are moving, but they're not moving. So what they did was they had one case in which the gears actually moved, all right? They gave it motion. And then another one where they just gave it this illusion. So this illusion has a lot of motion cues in it, but it's not actually moving versus something that's actually moving. And so they wanted to see if PredNet could distinguish between the two. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> they found that PredNet can accurately predict motion and direction and propeller motion in moving images. So when they had it, uh, the case where this was moving, it can predict the motion and direction of this, these propellers. It can also represent motion and direction for visual illusions. So when this, these things are stationary, like they are right now, it can also represent the motion and direction that you can see if you look at it as a human. And so these motion generated illusions may be produced through something called predictive coding, which we talked about. So the idea is that there's, uh, I don't know if this shows it. Well, this is the architecture for PredNet. So this is where uh, you have a number of layers in this PredNet architecture. Um, and you have a bunch of input features and it just uh, generates something over time that you know, allows it to predict uh, things like motion and things like other types of features like that. And so this is from an article, predictive coding networks meet action recognition. And so there's an active uh, area of research in this where they're looking at different stimuli and, and sort of dynamic stimuli and how those things are uh, you know, trying to understand them through predictive coding. Uh, so, but we have to remember that human and deep learning perception are very different things. And so uh, this article in Medium uh, by Carlos Perez actually talks about this, where he kind of takes a comparison between human perception and deep learning perception. And so uh, he asks the question, how do machines, or in this case, deep learning, do perception? Uh, so deep learning can be trained specifically to ignore higher order invariances, which means that they are selective in the things that they're looking at in, in an image. Um, networks are not trained with the ability to identify affordances, which are things in the environment that sort of uh, suggest an action. Like if you have a door handle, you know to turn the knob and push or pull. You know, you know what to do if you see a handle. You learn this through sort of your interactions with the environment. And we know like from, you know, in human culture, we have certain things that are affordances like door handles, where we learn them at a very young age, how to use them. And then we, but then we also expect things that look like door handles, maybe to behave in the same way. And so 
uh, networks are not trained with this ability, so they don't know how to identify things like affordances that are obvious to us. You might call it even common sense in a broader sense, but networks, neural, deep neural networks don't have that. Uh, they also have, they also rely heavily on occlusion perspective and shadow, which is both good and bad, and it allows them to differentiate things, but it also doesn't allow them to do things like uh, engage in this pareidolia. So they can, you know, you can, they can identify things that, it, the, the, as you've seen from the previous examples, human perception and machine perception differ quite a bit. And so he lays out why those are here. Uh, but there's also a neuroscience of pareidolia, and there are a couple studies that uh, focus on this phenomena and kind of explain what's going on in the brain. And so this article by Liu, uh, Seeing Jesus in Toast, Neuro and Behavioral Correlates of Face Pareidolia. Uh, in this, this study, they were looking at the interaction between top-down and bottom-up attentional processing. So top-down is face recognition, which is something that we do. Uh, we can recognize faces pretty easily. And bottom-up attentional processing is visual perception. So that's identifying like abstract shapes and things like that. And so they argue that faces, unlike other objects, are processed holistically. So we can see, we can recognize faces more quickly, especially if they're famous faces or ones that we've seen before, uh, much quicker than objects that form a face. Uh, but other forms of perception, such as audition, also exhibit pareidolia. And um, I'll talk about that in a, in a couple slides, um, an example of that. So another example of this is uh, from Barrick, 2019, and that's uh, a machine learning approach to predict perceptual decisions and insight into face pareidolia. So in this case, they talk about the perception of external stimuli in two ways. Uh, one is the as the characteristics of the stimulus and two is the outgoing brain activity prior to presentation. So when we perceive an external stimulus, we look at its characteristics, but there's also like a, a prior activity that we evaluate, or at least the brain does. Uh, and they found that spontaneous face brain activity during the pre-stimulus period might predict face pareidolia. So when we have a noisy image, we will see a face because that's what our prior experience tells us we should see. And so this is based on spontaneous brain activity. They measured, I think, EEG uh, in this study, and they actually found that there was some brain activity related to this sort of, uh, you know, sort of prediction. And they were able to find that time frequency components of hemispheric asymmetry in the brain uh, gave the best classification performance, but pre-stimulus alpha oscillations, which are components of the EEG signal, uh, it, uh, lead to predicting perceptual decisions. So this is, you know, a number of things going on in the brain that sort of uh, produce this effect. And so we have this, we can move from neural mechanisms, which are, you know, maybe a little bit, you know, not grounded in, say, machine learning. Uh, I mean, I don't know if they're useful in machine learning or not, but we can definitely classify different, think about this in a classificatory way. And so if we think about it in terms of identifying stimuli as like a true positive or a false positive, we can think of pareidolia as being a false positive. And so pareidolia is seeing something that is um, not a face, but giving it the attribution of a face. Um, and so if you see this in machine learning, uh, this can actually be elicited by malicious actors but it can also be uh, elicited by malicious actors in human life too. And the, if you see something that doesn't exist, you know, if you see like a face in something, you know, people can use that to exploit your, uh, you know, uh, they can, you know, they can use it to exploit you in different ways, or they can use it to exploit something, um, you know, but they can also do it in machine. We'll talk about how this works with machine learning algorithms in a bit. It's actually interesting. False po these false positives are interesting when they happen in the human brain, because on the one hand, they're sort of, you know, it's a false positive. So you see a face in something where there isn't a face. It's, you know, it's beneficial in some ways, but it's interesting. Uh, one of the examples, and this is not a visual example, this is from Touch, where uh, something called the cutaneous rabbit illusion. 
And so in this case, you have an experiment where the person closes their eyes and they just have their arm extended and the experimenter, experimenter delivers a series of taps going up the arm. So they start at the wrist and they go upward. And if, you, if they do this and the person's not looking, uh, sometimes people will report feeling something like a rabbit screwing up their arm or, a, or a, a mouse or something, you know, they'll report this is called the cutaneous rabbit because they use the example of a rabbit, but it could be anything that sort of scurries up your arm. And so obviously there was nothing scurrying up your arm, it was just someone delivering taps to your arm. But what's happening here is that you're not, it's not that there's anything running up your arm, it's that you're taking those cues that where it's hitting your arm and it's filling it, your brain is filling in the gaps. So it's basically taking these sensations and it's filling in an experience that maybe you've had or maybe if you've seen a rabbit hopping, you know that that's what happens and so you, you translate that to what's going on on your arm. And so they've done studies on this where they thought about this in terms of multisensory integration and they found that indeed people are integrating information uh, to explain what's going on with their arm but they can't see and verify with vision. And so that's one thing that in the brain that happens that's interesting. Uh, but in machine learning, this is something that is somewhat of a, you know, it it has a strange, it's, it's unknown what the relationship is with model robustness and model brittleness. So people have thought about this in terms of uh, deep learning AI being easy to fool. Uh, there's an article on that. There's also an article on uh, uh, robust physical world attacks on deep learning models. So there's this idea of there being um, adverse, it's it's being the uh, risk for an adversarial attack. And we'll see what that looks like in a minute. Um, there's another paper, Houdini fooling deep structured prediction models. So they, they give a way to fool deep structure uh, prediction models, which are based on deep learning models. And ADVAT, uh, real world adversarial attack on arc face face ID system. So this is again another example of an adversarial attack. So an adversarial attack is where you attack the network with things it has not seen before or you try to fool it in some way um, and you try to um, break the system. And so it's a little bit, it's a way to like test for robustness. And so this is an example where they took the stop sign and they rotated it and so they made it, they had it look like a stop sign, but then they also rotated it. So it would look like a dumbbell or squished it down. So it looked like a, ra a tennis racket. And so they're able to like change the shape of the stop sign. And so when they enter it into the algorithm, the algorithm might misidentify it as something that it isn't. So the stop sign is clearly a stop sign if we look at it as a human, but the algorithm won't know that if it's in this shape, at the right, that it's actually a stop sign and a tennis racket. Um, even natural images can fool uh, deep neural networks because they might focus on the picture's color, texture, or background rather than picking out the salient features that a human would recognize. And so they see this, for example, this um, insect here as a manhole cover just because it looks maybe like a manhole cover given the background and the foreground. Or this mushroom looks like a pretzel because it's shaped like a pretzel, not because it is a pretzel. It's just using a different set of cues. So finally, uh, you know, this might also be happening in cells themselves. We talked about human brains. We talked about um, neural networks. Now we might actually talk about cells. And this is a paper I found um, from 2015 on oscillatory stress stimulation uncovering an Achilles heel of the yeast map case signaling network. So in yeast, there's the signaling network that is a generalized stress response. And what they did in this experiment was they, um, they wanted to interpret changing environmental information over time by systematically monitoring the growth of yeast cells under varying frequencies of oscillating osmotic stress. And so they had this environmental stress uh, they delivered it in different frequencies over time. And then they saw that the cell showed this hyperactivated transcriptional stress response. But then they also claim that they're in yeast, remember, 
they don't have a brain, but they do have like, it's a eukaryotic cell. There's a sensory misperception in that the cells incorrectly interpret oscillations as a staircase of ever increasing osmolarity. So instead of, uh, you know, instead of understanding that the fluctuations in osmolarity or oscillations, they respond as if the stress is ever increasing. And so they, they interpret this as a sensory misperception. That not, might not be the correct interpretation of the data, but this is what they're doing. It's a science paper. So, I mean, you know, it might be, it might, it, there might be something to it. Um, so mis misperception as they, as they make this term, as they define this term, is the capacity of the osmolarity sensing MAPK network to re-trigger uh, or to introduce sequential osmotic stresses. And so this, uh, this is sort of what they define as misperception and it results in a trade-off of fragility to non-natural oscillatory inputs that match the re-triggering time. So as they make these perturbations, they're able to expose hidden sensitivities of the network, of the cell regulatory network. And so in triggering these sort of responses, they're able to play around with the way it perceives the environmental stimulus. Uh, and then that's all I have on that. So I think that's, I wanted to update it because I didn't think that there was enough stuff on um, sort of maybe on biology. Uh, when we did the original DVORM ML course, we, we really just did focus on the machine learning aspect, which was nice, but I wanted to also put a little bit of a biology twist in there because I think there's a, there's a lot of stuff out there on machine learning. So I think, you know, people, there are a lot of people who do it better. But I think our, our advantage is that we have this sort of biological interest. Um, so, any questions about that or comments? It was a nice presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I have to something, I have to add something regarding the theory building. Uh, nothing that we are going to do yeah yeah so we that we all uh, that uh, here we have done something uh, regarding the neuro match and endeavor learn i think that if it's possible we can compile all of those things and add more things and why not uh, make it uh, into three four volumes and uh, you know produce them as free kindle books because uh, it would give us the Devo one group a lot of, you can say, recognition. We can make it freely available. Anyone can download it. And since Amazon has such a great user base, uh, we can you know get more uh, contributors and more people who can join us. Because uh, very, uh, you can say, a very few persons, uh, mostly of biological background, you know, uh, surf GitHub and the po probability of getting our tutorial you know, is uh, the chances are the odds are low, so we can produce a, I think, a ebook, a free ebook of you can say four volumes of hundred to one fifty pages. Yeah, I think that would be great. Um, I mean, we'd have to think about what we would want to put in it, but yeah, I think we yeah. could put something in it, and definitely. Um, we have yeah, we have already material for Neuromatch, and we have some Devo on a devo learn a material and we can compile more and at least we can make uh, make the first volume in you can say two three months of time yeah i think that'd be good uh, so, yeah so what do you think yeah i think that would be a good idea i mean the only thing we'd have to figure out is what we'd want to put together for it and um but yeah i think that would work because yeah, I think we, yeah, I think trying to get people engaged in things is tough because you have some people, it's like, you know, you don't know where exactly to target. Like GitHub is not, like, not a, it's it's a broad audience, but it's only certain types of people go there. And, yeah. some, you know, yeah, I get, I get your point there. Um, yeah, and I've seen, you know, publications of Nature and Springer, some of them are paid, so they don't have openness. So we can, uh, you can, if we target an openness, uh, 
that's what we are doing we can target a lot of people i guess yeah i think so yeah yeah it certainly helps to have open access yeah yeah i think so yeah the idea of a book sounds interesting i probably won't be able to help until after i finish my mechanics course that i'm taking this coming term um i'm going to be very busy yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. well it's yeah it's something definitely to, to revisit and, and and get together i mean i'll take a while but we can we can think about it so yeah that's good yeah. um so yeah. then i guess uh Shruti, did you have anything to add or Um, no, sir, but the presentation actually I really liked it. It's something that even I was looking for. And I guess links would really help me because I was um, kind of working on it right now. I'm learning uh, something like this. I'm working on convolution. Okay. Yeah, I'll send out the presentation and you can get to the links and everything. And if you have other questions about it, be, f be sure to. I know you, I think you're in uh, in the Slack channel. So you could ask questions in the Slack channel. Yeah, yeah, definitely, sir. Okay. All right. Um, so I guess I'll finish up today. We'll talk about uh, two papers. So I let's see. I have a bunch of stuff in this folder, but I I do have two papers. So Krishna actually sent me. Well, he sent me the one that we just saw, but he also sent me a link to this. And then Susan today mentioned this paper, so we should probably talk about it. Um, so this is a paper, and then we'll talk about this other paper, which is related. Um, so this paper is called Temporal Scaling in C. elegans Larval Development. And this is, uh, I think, a new preprint in the bioarchive. Uh, and so the abstract here is, is the following. Uh, it is essential that correct temporal order of cellular events is maintained during animal development. So you have, like, single cell and then you have a bunch of cells that proliferate and then in C. elegans of course the cells are programmed so uh, they're sort of deterministic so once you get like an a b and a p1 cell in the two cell stage the p1 cells will always become sort of the posterior end of the animal it includes the germline and includes some other muscles and things like that and the a b is the anterior end but it also has a lot of cells that are going to become, uh, you know, neurons and muscle and things like that. And so um, we, and then they migrate as, you know, as, as development proceeds and then you end up with your adult. So yeah, it is important to have that temporal order. Um, during post-embryonic development, the rate of development depends on external conditions such as food availability, diet, and temperature. So what they're referring to there is the uh, larval stages where you have, uh, where you can actually have plasticity of behavior depending on environmental inputs. So in the L1 stage, which is soon after hatching out of the egg, they have this period where if they experience starvation, they can live for a long time, just sort of, sort of in the suspended animation. Uh, and then maybe around L2 or L3, they can go into the dower stage, which is where their cuticle grows really thick and they can basically hibernate. Uh, and it's all in response to like food availability. So there are a lot of things going on in the larval period that can be uh, that, you know, and, but then that affects their later growth as adults. Um, and so how the timing of cellular events is impacted when the rate of development is changed at the organismal level is not known. So if you're changing the rate of development, what happens to cellular events in terms of their timing? That's the question they're asking. And so they use a novel time-lapse microscopy approach to simultaneously measure timing of accelerotory gene expression, hypodermal stem cell divisions, and cuticle shedding in individual animals during C. elegans larval development from hatching to adulthood. So this is where you get in this larval phase, which is after the C. elegans is hatched, this is what they're measuring. And so it's worth saying that there are actually quite a few cells that are born post-embryonically. So once the egg hatches, it has about 580 to 600 cells. And then 
in the post-embryonic period, it gains the rest of its cells. And it's usually a lot of things in the, uh, in the epidermis and things like that. And so there's a lot of uh, cell birth uh, in the post-embryonic period. It's just not, they're not like critical to the physiology of the worm. It's just kind of like, you know, adaptations, uh, adaptation related. Um, so this, their study revealed strong variability in timing between isogenic individuals under the same conditions, meaning that they had the same genomes um, and they had under the same conditions. Um, so there was a lot of uh, strong variability there. However, this variability obeyed temporal scaling, meaning that events occurred at the same time when measured relative to the duration of development in each individual. We also observed pervasive changes in population average timing when temperature, diet, or genotype were varied. And so they have this, now you're varying the temperature, diet, or genotype uh, systematically. So with genotype, you can have different types of uh, defined mutants and they can behave differently or change the diet. Um, you know, they eat uh, bacteria, so you can change the concentration of bacteria and so forth. Um, but with larval development divided into epochs, they di that differed in how the timing of events were impacted. Yet these variations in timing were still explained by temporal scaling when timing was rescaled by the duration of respective epochs in each individual. Surprisingly, timing obeyed temporal scaling even in mutants lacking LIN42 period, which is a core regulator of timing of larval development. So even when you have this mutation that sort of knocks out this regulatory mechanism, you still have this scaling. Um, and so this, this scaling is exhibited by strongly delayed heterogeneous timing and growth arrest. Uh, timing of larval development is likely controlled by timers based on protein degradation or protein oscillations, but such mechanisms do not inherently generate temporal scaling. Hence, our observations will put strong constraints on models to explain timing of larval development. So, I, I guess maybe, you know, if I, this would probably be best prefaced with a presentation on larval development in C. elegans. But basically what they're saying here is that a lot of develop, these post-embryonic developmental things that happen, uh, there's a temporal scaling that isn't, it's actually independent of some of the things that, you know, we would expect them to be. Um, so the question about the developmental timing is a parallel in the context of spatial patterning during development. It has been shown that spatial gene expression patterns often scale with organ or embryo size. So with the spatial pattern adjusted in each individual organ or embryo so that the spatial features occur at the same position relative to overall size. Um, so for example, in Drosophila embryos, gap genes are expressed in bands along the anterior or posterior body axis, such as from the front to the back. Uh, these bands have highly stereotypical positions relative to the embryo size even though their size shows significant variability between individuals. Moreover, embryos of closer related species that vary greatly in size exhibit the same number of bands of similar position relative to the size of the embryo. So they have this, uh, they basically have the same number of bands, it's just that they're spread out. So the signal isn't related to the size of the organism, it's related to some other factor. It's, you know, something about like the way the genes are expressed. And so they have the same number of bands, it's just spread out. Um, here we examine whether analogous to scaling or spa of spatial patterns in development, the timing of development exhibits temporal scaling, meaning that when the organism level, organism level rate of development is changed, the timing of individual events is adjusted so that they still occur at the same time when measured relative to the total duration of development. So. In other words, you know, if you change the length of development, like from maybe uh, two weeks to three weeks, and this is just hypothetical, the different uh, events will spread out in time. They won't just like have the same time and then there'll be an extra week of nothing going on. They'll spread out evenly. Um, it's interesting because you can actually do 
manipulations experimentally where you delay development through some of the things I mentioned about starvation. And you can actually change the length of development in that way. And so then the question is, is what happens after they come out of starvation? And the answer is they either catch up, meaning that they start to grow a lot faster, or they, uh, you know, maybe miss some of those developmental periods altogether. And, you know, it, it depends. It, so, I mean, you know, there's a lot of, there are a lot of interesting things you can do to, to look at the scaling effect and see where it plays a role and where it doesn't play a role. But what they're saying is that, generally speaking, these developmental events are, you know, they don't just change their order. Or they don't change their duration of time. You know, um, they're sort of, there's this uh, order in how they occur. And so that can't really be changed by changing the environment. Uh, due to its invariant cell lineage and highly stereotypical development, C. elegans is an ideal model organism to study this. Um, it's, it's post embryonic development consists of these four stages. Um, and uh, let's see. There is a clear periodic aspect to C. elegans development with molts occurring every 8 to 10 hours at 25 degrees Celsius. So they, what they do is they molt their cuticle, their cuticle sheds, and it's a very regular process. Um, each developmental stage is where they have a molt. So at the end of L1, there's a molt. At the end of L2, there is a molt and so forth. And this is very regular in terms of its timing. Um, and so these larval stages are accompanied by a genome-wide oscillatory expression of a multitude of genes which with peaks occurring uh, once per larval stage. So these larval stages are sort of examples of this developmental timing where they're all sort of organized um, evenly and they all have this uh, regularity to them. And so you see how sort of this post-embryonic uh, development is organized around this, this timing. And so this is an example here um, where they have, they show like uh, these pulses of, of uh, gene expression over time. Uh, you have this, these divisions in the cell a lineage, so you have these different peaks um, put in, in terms of the cell lineage. So this is L1 through L4. Um, this, these are seam cells. These are the cells that undergo morphogenesis during the post-embryonic period. And so these seam cells, which are in the cuticle, basically, in the epidermis, they divide and they can look at the cell division and seam cells to see this sort of scaling. And so why is scaling important, you might ask? I mean, other than regulating development. Well, as it turns out, this is very important for like when there are different, you know, when there are speciation events and when there's variation in the developmental process. So, you know, when, when organisms, when they become different species, sometimes different species have different developmental, length of developmental period and all that. This scaling kind of helps keep it even over, you know, as the developmental period shrinks and, and expands with speciation. So, you know, you might have a species of um, of nematode that has a developmental period that's three times the length of like C. elegans, or could be one third of the length of C. elegans. And so, you know, that might be in, but they share like basically the same genetic program and everything. So how do you, how does that all get regulated? Well, this temporal scaling actually helps because it just basically scales things up and down. You see this a lot in the in in the growth of animals. So you see this with in terms of body length. You see this in terms of body length versus like uh, head size or wing size or whatever. You'll see this a lot where you know the body size, depending on what it is, if it's larger or smaller, uh, the other organs will scale in terms of size as well, and that scaling will persist across the wide range of species. And so it's a very um, it's a very useful mechanism in terms of developmental change, but it also helps to keep development uh, regulated. 
And so you can see there are a lot of papers on scaling. Basically, it's mathematical scaling where they look at like maybe like the length of development or the body size across the wide range of variation. And then they see that there are other things that are sort of related to it uh, fractionally. So, you know, um, the like the, the uh, larval periods are one example. The larval periods scale, you know, one quarter of the uh, length of development. And so you might see that as development, var the length of development varies, that those larval periods will vary as well. Now that can change over evolutionary time. You can see what changes in different uh, developmental periods in terms of their relative lengths. But, you know, if, if you leave everything alone, you leave these uh, mechanisms to their own devices, they'll basically observe the scaling relationship. So they, they talk a lot about this in here. They, they do a lot of, uh, uh, they do a lot of analysis here. Um, and then they start to get into where they're manipulating diet and they're manipulating genotype. Um, and then there's this discussion here where they talk about they look at the changing of timing in individual developmental, event, uh, developmental events under a broad array of conditions that change the total duration of larval development. Uh, these are largely explained by temporal scaling, both for variability and timing between individuals and for population changes. Uh, we found that many of our experimental observations could be reproduced by simple, simple phenomenological timing models. In these models, the complexity of developmental progression is reduced to the evolution of a developmental phase in time, similar to the use of phase in the analysis of nonlinear oscillators. Um, so animal to animal variability arises because each animal proceeds through its phase evolution at an intrinsically different rate, giving rise to strongly correlated variability we measured for timing of event pairs. Um, while these Phenomenological models do not provide a molecular mechanism for temporal scaling. They reveal a remarkably simple organization that unifies the broad variations seen of timing seen, seen in our experiments. And so, uh, yeah, so if you want to learn more about this paper, I would just go ahead and read the rest of it. Um, I, I can send it out. Um, I think, well, I mean, I can send it out with in an email or on Slack. I think a couple of you already have it. So uh, it's definitely an interesting paper. So I'll put this link to the folder in the chat, and we, but I'll send out the paper later. And then I wanted to talk about this other paper that Krishna sent me during the meeting here. So this is a new brain inspired intelligent system drives a car using only 19 control neurons. So this is imitating the nematode's ner nervous system by nematode, they mean C. elegans, to process information efficiently. This new intelligence system is more robust, more interpretable, and faster to train than current deep neural network architecture than millions of parameters. So this is actually, if you know anything about the Open Room Robotics group, you know that they're doing basically this. They're creating these networks of C. elegans neurons and then they're simulating the neurons using uh, a couple of different programs, like I think C302 is the main one. And then they're using that to, uh, you know, basically they can create like a, a movement circuit, like, you know, you would observe in a C. elegans, and they know the parameters that are used in C. elegans movement. And so they can just basically simulate that and they can map that to a robot and the robot will behave like a worm. And so, that we know how to do this. We kind of know the control circuitry for C. elegans. But what they're doing here is they're reducing it down to 19 neurons. And then they're actually using this to control like a vehicle, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so this is uh, the picture here where there's a self-driving car. This is the camera input. This is the attention map. And they're using a convolutional method here and then here's the network here of interneurons, command neurons, and, and a motor neuron. And so uh, this is a deep supervised model uh, that they're comparing it to. 
Uh, we all know that really deep supervised models work great when we have sufficient data to train them. One of the hardest things to do is to generalize well and do it efficiently. We can always go deeper, but it has a high computational cost. So as you may already be thinking, there must be another way to make machines intelligent with much less data or fewer layers. And so to get around this trade-off, and this is app applying it to self-driving cars, they're using this method of using uh, this neural network using C. elegans as an inspiration. So actually they're, okay, so researchers from IST Austria and MIT have successfully trained a self-driving car uh, based on the brains of tiny animals such as threadworms. They achieved that with only a few neurons able to control the self-driving car compared to the millions of neurons needed by the popular deep neural networks such as Inceptions, ResNets, or VGG. Their network was able to completely control a car using only 75,000 parameters composed of 19 control neurons rather than millions. And so uh, since it's so small, it doesn't have to be a black box. So we know what's going on inside the model. It's, it's a transparent model and we kind of know, uh, you know, we can tune it relatively well. Um, so in this case, uh, they actually cite openworm here. <laughs> I don't know if they cite openworm. They do have the openworm image here. So they're giving an attribution, but uh, this is an example here of how this works. So you have this, uh, Level, you have motor neurons, command inner neurons, upper inner, inner neurons, and sensory neurons. And they array them in this network. And then they make a bunch of observations. And so this is where they're, this is their sort of their model, uh, their network model that they're using. Um, and so they developed a new mathematical model of neurons and synapses called the liquid time constant, or LTC neurons. Uh, one way to make this network simpler was to make it sparse, meaning that not every cell is connected to every other cell. When a cell is activated, the others are not, which reduces the computation time, since all of the deactivated cells will not send any output, or a zero input, which is extremely faster to compute. Uh, oh, Ramin Hassani, who's a person from Openworm, is on this paper. So, uh, talks about I think he's on this paper. I'm not really sure. I know he's in Austria, so, uh, but he was cited in this article. The processing of signals within the individual cells follow different mathematical principles than previous deep learning models. So we get into this a little bit deeper in the model. It consists of two parts. At first, there's a compact convolutional neural network, which is used to extract structural features from the pixels of the input image. Using such information, the network decides which part of the image is important or interesting and passes only this part to the second system, uh, which they then can call a control system that steers the vehicle using decisions made by a set of biologically inspired neurons. This control part is also called a neural circuit policy, or NCB, NCP. Basically, it translates the data from the compact convolutional model outputs only 19 neurons in an RNN structure inspired by the nematode's nervous system controlling the vehicle and allowing it to stay in the lanes. Okay, I remember this actually. I think I posted this paper, the actual paper, I think in the papers channel in Slack. So if you're interested, go check the paper channel in Slack and there should be a paper in there. It could be the, the papers channel or the general channel, I can't remember which. Well, anyways, they're able to do this, and they compare it to a number of different types, types of networks, CNNs of different types, RNNs, LSTM, and NPC, NCP. And so you can see that the number of parameters is lower, the number of neurons is lower, and the number of synapses is much lower, and the number of trainable parameters is lower as compared to all these other types of networks. Um, so being so small, they were able to see where the system was focusing its attention on the images fed. And so they found that such a small network extracting the most important part of the picture made the few decision neurons fo focus exclusively on the curbside and on the horizon. So this is a self-driving car, and they're focusing on these two different places in the image, which is a unique behavior among artificial intelligence systems that are currently analyzing every single detail of an image. So it's basically filtering the image. Um, and then so this is, uh, 
So while noise is a big problem for current approaches, such as rain or snow and lane keeping applications, their NCP system demonstrated a strong resistance to input artifacts because of its architecture and novel neural modeling keeping their attention on the road horizon, even if the input camera is noisy, as you can see in this short video. So here you can see they're driving in the rain and the algorithm has to focus attention on sort of the, the road as it's like going off into the distance. So it's constantly able to keep its attention on the end of the road here, or sort of as the road is going off to the edge of the scene here. Um, it's able to keep its attention on the road and not maybe on other things like the wipe, windshield wipers or the rain or the trees. Um, so they've created tutorials on this. So there are tutorial links to these tutorials in GitHub. Um, and you can check it out there. Um, this is, yeah, so if you read the original paper, uh, that'll give you a lot more information. Plus this video also may give you a lot more information. So it's a very interesting uh, uh, thing. And thank you, uh, Krishna, for giving out or, or bringing your attention to that. Uh, I know that that was the paper that Roman, I think, was a part. I, I put that in uh, the open room Slack and I had meant to present it, but I never got around to it. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, and thank you for Susan and Krishna for bringing together the, uh, that our attention to that scale, temporal scaling paper as well it was very good. Although I think it's going to require a little bit more, uh, if, if, you know, if you read it, you're going to maybe have to read some background on some other things, but that's, that's why we do these things just as an educational opportunity. So do we have any other comments or questions before we go? I'm looking from my side. Okay. <laughs> Susan or Shudi? No, no sir, nothing from my side either. either. Okay. All right. Okay, okay but, uh, um, bye. bye. I'm, I'm, I need to study mechanics today, today so. so. Oh. <laughs> well, good luck. <laughs> My class starts in five minutes, so. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right, take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. See you later.